and just step by step. Well, you get this far into the temple, you meet somebody else, and hey, wait a minute, buddy. You know, you're not getting past here unless you do something, and then you, you do that. It's just like in the, the, the Book of the Dead, only maybe not as, as uh, complex. So the, um, another thing in masonry that, that I think sets it a, really apart from and really makes it a mystical organization, uh, although many of my father would say, no, it's not a mystical organization, you know, that just pages after pages in the index of Kabbalah, you know, come on, Dad. But uh, what makes it uh, mystical, even with those uh, members who don't have a mystical, you know, bent, is that they have to memorize tons of stuff, tons of stuff. The master's lecture is 45 minutes to, to uh, you know, an, an hour, depending on the speed, and it's wonderful stuff, and these guys do it. They're 90 years old up there doing it, you know, just like whoever had to prep themselves with this Book of the Dead thing. Okay. They had to memorize a ton of stuff. So the, I can just imagine, it's like a pep talk, you know? Okay, I'm dead now. Some, I, you know, I better take control of this experience. Otherwise, I'm going to be eaten by a, you know, a hippopotamus with a crocodile head, you know. My soul's just going to just, just disperse, you know. So I better get a hold of myself. Okay, I'm walking through a door. Uh-oh, there's a guy there. I know his name. He's going to ask me, what's my name? You know, I know his name, you know. Uh, uh, you know, crocodile sandal is your name, you know. And just one thing after another, don't stop. Okay, don't stop, don't pause. You've got this and this and this. I know your name. Here's the name of your socks. Here's the name of your floor. Here's the name of the hasp on the door. Here's the name of the thing. Okay, go on, go on. Okay, then I go on to the next step. And then I memorize. I've got this all memorized. I know just what I'm going to see. I know just what I'm going to say. I've got, I built this temple inside me with my memory. I, I've already built it, okay? And it's inside me and I'm going through the thing and there's a door way at the other end I'm shooting for and I'm not going to take a breath. I don't need to take a breath. I'm dead. I'm going to go all the way to the, to the end before I let my concentration drop. And if you get all the way to the end, you've gone someplace in your own in your own temple that most people never get to in the death experience. In a strange sort of way, I could see how it might even hold the key to overcoming death. Overcoming death is just uh, 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 gaining knowledge of the, 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 or having consciousness of the continuity of existence. And there might be a technique in order that would enable you to uh, uh, perpetuate your consciousness of the continuity of your own existence. And the Book of the Dead may, uh, may hold that. Lucid dreaming may signal the onset of a higher state of consciousness. It may be a badge of attainment for the initiate, as is suggested in our chemical allegory. The metaphor of the Philosopher's Stone, as applied to lucid dreaming, is a revealing one. Lucid dreams make their first appearance as fleeting moments in the dream state, with conscious work and practical exercises that reinforce the ability to lucid dream, the moments of waking dream time become more extended and controllable. In the metaphor of the Philosopher's Stone, 
the lesser stone is perfected through a crystallization or hardening, rendering it permanent. From here, we can extrapolate an even higher state, where the disincarnate intelligence of the deceased can be equipped with the mental tools, the strength and persistence of consciousness to remember itself through the transformation process and achieve a lucid afterlife. In this case, the Philosopher's Stone is the perfecting and making permanent the ability of the dreamer or the deceased to exercise conscious control, to rule the mysterious other world, accessed in both the dream state and the afterlife. The faculty of imagination seems to be the womb in which the fetus gestates. We can now see the process of perfection of the Materia Prima come full circle. If the alchemical steps are carefully observed and the great work is persisted at during life, one's consciousness becomes the purified and perfectly structured philosopher's stone, the charcoal that becomes a diamond. It is impenetrable, permanent and highly valuable. It becomes the permanent vessel of the self through the higher registers. There's now, in the year 2003, um, ample literature testifying to near-death experiences, paranormal experiences. Again, these are mocked at by the opposition, by the skeptics, but the people who've had those experiences, and in fact very serious scientists and scholars who've studied those people, are convinced that they're not crazy and they're not fooling themselves, and that there is something that survives the body after death. So here in the Valley of the Kings, we see a testament to that Egyptian call it belief, call it understanding, call it what you will, but in order to get anything out of the concept, and in fact anything out of this episode, uh, it's useful to bear in mind that the Egyptians quite possibly knew what they were talking about when they went to this incredible amount of attention to mummify the body of the pharaoh, and the even more incredible attention that they put into building these fabulous, magically decorated tombs.